voting body, which itself has previously been marred by controversy, will be watched closely as it also seeks to deal with claims of state capture. For more on this, the National Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, Professor, that's uh, Advocate Shamila Batoy, joins us in studio now. Advocate, good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for making the time to talk to us. The state of lawlessness in our country right now, some will interpret it as um, a result of the 2008 xenophobic attacks where it does not appear that anyone may have been prosecuted successfully for those violent crimes that led to about 60 people dying. Do you have any uh, record of who was actually prosecuted successfully at that time? I don't have a record of who was successfully prosecuted, but I do know that there were a number of successful prosecutions. Um, I can't give you the figures now, but um, there were many cases that were brought to court and were successfully prosecuted. And so wh what do the prosecutions involve? At that, at that time, it's going back a, a while, I'm trying to recall, but I know there was certainly damage to property, um, you know, assault cases. Um, I'm not sure if there were any murders, but um, there were certainly a number of cases that were prosecuted at the time. Uh, how do and in you... fact, there was, if I recall, there was certainly, you know, there were task teams that, they, that were put together and there was, there were special courts, if I'm not mistaken, but there was certainly a, you know, it was a priority at the time and a lot of attention was given to properly managing these cases and fast tracking them through the courts at the time. Mm. Uh, how do you respond to someone who says the sense of impunity that we see in our streets, in our communities today, with the flare up of yet more xenophobic attacks, is possibly as a result of no person having been made an example of? Well, I'm not sure that that is, that is the cause of, of, it, uh, of the violence at the moment, you know. But, um, you know, what is clear is that people do feel that they can act with a sense of impunity, and that is very, very worrying in our country because it means that people feel that they can commit crimes and that there will be no effective investigations, there will be no effective prosecutions, and there will be no consequences. And that is what needs to change. But, but they're right, so, aren't they? I mean, I mean we, we're hearing of, of empty court, uh, courtrooms uh, waiting for cases to come through, not only with the xenophobic violence, but with the gender-based violence, where people aren't being rounded up. I mean, it's a combination of a, a lack of sort of legal infrastructure and bad policing. Well, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't say empty courtrooms because the courtrooms are really full and the court rolls are extremely high. So, um, you know, at this point in time, there's, uh, there's a, you know, law enforcement and prosecution police takes this very, very seriously. I met with the National Commissioner um, just yesterday with three of his very senior brigadiers as well as two very senior colleagues in the NPA to look at what can we as law enforcement do to ensure that we can restore some confidence in the people that these cases are being taken seriously, that they are being seriously uh, dealt with within the system. Um, it's an outrage that you know women and children um, are, are being violated in, in these ways. And as law enforcement, we need to instill confidence that something's being done about it. So, you know, we met yesterday and looked at um, how we could fast track these cases through the system. Of course, we have to work with the judiciary, uh, the magistrates that actually are the, the ones that manage the court roles. But looking at cases, we have a team in, in the, in, I've spoken to the director of public prosecutions in Western Cape. He's got a team of people that are giving specific attention to this case and many of the other cases that have happened in other parts of the country, the Western Cape cases and other cases where we're giving it very specific attention to try to get it to the courts as quickly as possible. But in addition to that, you know, more broadly, uh, we've talked to the police and we're looking at initiatives like, you know, looking at there was an anti, there is an anti-rape strategy in the, in the uh, police. And so we're looking at, the police are looking to review that and to broaden it to look more at sexual and gender-based crimes, not just anti-rape. But to look at how implementation, I think that's, you know, that's been the challenge. You know, I think the country has, we have great strategies and we have great plans, but implementation is, is the problem. And so we're looking at how we could, um, there's a backlog of sexual and gender-based crimes. We're looking at how we can fast track that, put together teams to look at cases that may have been withdrawn uh, for whatever reason 
and to consider whether those cases, if there was investigation outstanding, uh, forensic evidence, for example, to look at how those cases can be put onto the systems again and fast track these cases so that we really, um, you know, so that people know that there's no impunity for these cases and that you will face the full brunt of the law if you commit sexual and gender based crimes and a whole range of other crimes as well. Advocate Patoy, at the moment we have the cases that South Africans are watching very closely. Nicholas Ninao has confessed to raping the seven-year-old girl in Pretoria. You also have uh, the man who killed the UCT student, Uinene Mkhwetyana, admitting to having uh, raped and killed her. What kind of sentences will you be asking for? As a prosecution um, in these cases, we will ask for the maximum sentences in these cases. And what are we talking um, about? There are, there's a minimum sentence case that are applicable in, in various types of offences, including certain sexual and gender-based crimes like rape and murder. And so in this particular case, you know, we will certainly be looking, trying to get the maximum sentences, life if possible. And um, yeah, so that is what we'll certainly be asking for. You say that you take rape seriously, all departments take rape yes. seriously, but uh, and I quote you here, you said uh, it, it's not about chasing statistics, but I'm hearing within the NPA that it is all about chasing statistics. So often a rape accused will have the charges dropped so that that case can be finalized very quickly, or the, 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 the victim, and I'm, I'm quoting something from the Cape Times here, she's a rape survivor who feels that she was left high and dry by justice. She was raped five months ago. Nobody got in touch with her. They're still waiting for the DNA. And she was asked to mediate with a man accused of raping her. I mean, how is that taking anybody seriously? I mean, that is just deeply offensive. Look, we will have to look at this particular case, but I agree with but you. But this is not the first. I agree with you. You know, we should not be looking at mediating these cases. We have to have a victim-centric approach to justice. And so, you know, if, the, if the, the survivor herself wants to sort of engage in those kinds of uh, alternate dispute resolution mechanisms, as, as the NPA, to start off with, we say these serious cases should not be resolved in that way, and that it is about being a victim-centered approach. So, you know, I'm, you know, there are many instances where the justice system has failed the, the victims of crime, and we need to look at... You know, we do have the Tutuzela care centers that were set up in the National Prosecuting Authority, which is, a, which is actually a, a global best practice in terms of how the victims of sexual and gender-based crime should be managed, right from, it's a multidisciplinary approach, right from the time a report is made at the centers, through the various support, uh, the different types of support that a victim would need until the matter is taken through the court system. And that has, as I said, it's, it's been recognized as a, as a best practice in terms of really supporting victims and survivors through this process. But that is not available throughout the country, and we have to look at how where these centers, where these centers are not present, how we can still ensure that the victims of, of, and survivors of these, of these crimes are dealt with in a way in which you know, respects their rights and gives them all of the different types of psychological and other support services that they need. And very often, these services are lacking. You know, that is a reality. Advocate Patoy, can I just ask you this question? How do you measure the success of a prosecutor? Well, it's not just about a conviction. You know, and that's to be clear. We're not just chasing statistics. The, the success of a prosecutor, I think to start off with is, we must be caring prosecutors. We must treat the people that walk into you know, the courts or in, in whatever context that we engage with them, with humility, and that we must actually do the best for them. And of course, ensure that the case is properly investigated and that we're able to take the case to court. But it's not just about a conviction. It's about how we actually deal with the victims of crime, how we engage with them, what kind of support, being empathetic towards them. I think that is what I would say is, is a successful a prosecutor who behaves like a prosecutor. Okay, but is the success real? I'll go back to the point that I made about lowering charges, you know, arresting a, a possible rapist, 
and you know slapping him on the wrist and you know with, with a 200 rand fine which we have heard has been going on in order for prosecutors to say I've I've concluded this case it is a su success I mean obviously that's damaging on so many levels particularly because now you have a rapist on the street who doesn't have a criminal record and it goes back to that horrific post office uh, murder yes. that we have seen where somebody who had a criminal record it, w it wasn't even noted so I'm just wondering how you are able to track people who don't have a, a record how you monitor them well you know just uh, um, you know those cases that you mention you know I would certainly like to get the details of those cases so that we can look into them and and look at what was the attitude of the prosecutor was it a case where uh, a person accused of rape got a 200 and five I mean that's an outrage so but we have to look at the specific I need to get the facts it's fairly widespread well you know that's why I say you know we anecdotally hear things and for for me to respond to those I need to have the facts of the case so that we can go back all the DPPs the directors of public prosecutions throughout the country are sensitized to this they understand the seriousness and the gravity of uh, rape cases and other sexual and gender-based crimes it is a priority for the NPA and so we take these very seriously so you know these these allegations that you know this is what has happened is something we I will definitely look into personally and if necessary contact the victims and look at how we could actually better support them mm -hmm. and to ensure that these things do not have it should not happen no. in the justice system can we look at uh, the evidence that is coming out of the state capture inquiry you we understand that you have investigators that are sitting there on a daily taking notes how many cases would you say are caught ready that are coming out of the state capture inquiry there's you know state capture there's there's um, you know there's a lot of cases that uh, well, a lot of evidence that's being tendered at the at the Commission itself but in addition to that there's a number of cases that are not being alluded to at the Commission uh, where a lot is going on in many parts of the world with regard to government officials that have been charged um, and other even people in private practice so there's a lot of cases relating to corruption that is in the court space but with regard to the Commission of Inquiry um, as you know the directorate has the investigating directorate has just been set up advocate Cronier is is leading that the cases are not court ready um, and we will certainly once they are court ready proceed to take them to court but building these cases it that are very complex people must understand that there's a difference between someone testifying in a commission of inquiry and and investigative journalism which pays a really important role in this and actually getting a watertight case and sufficient evidence to charge people to ensure that when we do take these cases to court we're not going to fail and these cases are going to you know the best defense is going to be put up and we need to make sure that we're able to withstand that and we don't have another Estina Dairy debacle where cases are brought to court but, but you and have then an withdrawn. immense amount of pressure on you because you've just had the SACP in the province of Gauteng marching to your office using the words you are the weak link so how much longer well as long as it takes for us to get the evidence I think people have to understand that um, you know if you look at it in the context of what has happened in the, in the in the past years there was a deliberate attempt to make sure that these cases state capture cases never got investigated properly and would never see the inside of a courtroom but and so the we information excuse me jumping in here is already in the public domain so i mean much yes. of it is known yes i mean how much of that has already been put into to the investigation and 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 are you waiting for the zondo commission to give you the go ahead or will you go ahead beforehand no we're not waiting for the for the Zondo Commission to complete its work I mean we certainly don't want to wait until then and get an avalanche of terabytes of, of information and evidence that we need to wade through so we are certainly working in parallel and looking at many of the cases that have been mentioned in the Zondo Commission and you know the capacitation of the investigation director has been a challenge in terms of funding and in being able to actually get people on board very quickly you know government has very specific rules about how you recruit people and so we've had to get deviations from Treasury etc so we are able to actually recruit pre people differently and not go through the normal recruitment processes so there are teams that are working on these cases and you know I can you can rest assured that you know we are acutely aware of people being simply tired and people want to see action and so you know we are under no illusions about the need to actually ensure 
that we can restore the confidence of the people in the system. But we also know that we need to make sure that we move when these cases are ready to be. We have sufficient evidence to proceed with them. In the light of what you're saying, that people are tired of waiting, the oh, VBS angry, matter, say. indeed, the VBS matter is one case that has really upset South Africans. And if a, an investigative journalist can follow the money trail mm -hmm. so closely to what is being revealed now about the allegations as to the extent of the involvement of the EFF leader, Julius Malema, it begs the question, where are our prosecutors and how is it that an investigative journalist can do this kind of work where a prosecutor could have done it with ease, particularly with the kind of uh, instruments that they can use to try and subpoena some of the information, for example. I think what people need to understand that investigative journalism plays a really important role. And certainly, you know, it's, um, we have huge respect for those journalists that go out there and uncover these things. Um, but it's not the same as bringing a case to court. Um, we need to have, you know, forensic, they are not going to come and testify in court about the paper trail, etc. We need to make sure that we have forensic uh, investigations that actually uh, convert that information into evidence that is admissible in court. And so that those processes need to go through because these will all be challenged. And so we need to make sure that we actually collect the evidence in accordance with the admissibility requirements and that when we present them in court, they are actually admitted as evidence. So I can ask you very briefly, I, I know you say not court ready, but can you sure. give us a time? I mean, is it a month, six months, a year? Yeah, <laughs> that's a million dollar question. All I can say is, um, you know, we, we are aware of, of the need to actually move quickly on these cases. And uh, we will certainly as soon as possible. But a lot of work is going on into these cases. Apparently you're sitting with rims of files of uh, the arms deal matter. How do you plan to tackle that? Well, the Sariti Commission now has, uh, you know, uh, well, we've, I've actually just got a, I've asked the prosecutors that worked on, on the case previously to let me have a report on that. I've received a report on that, and uh, there may be a need for us to, to take action in those cases and to certainly reopen the, the books on that one. I think that's the word that South Africans are looking for, reopen the case yes. on the arms deal. Yes, that's we certainly your... will engage with the SAPs and the police on, on looking into that again. Yes. Advocate Shamila Batoy, thank you very much for making the time to speak to us here on the South African Morning. Advocate Shamila Batoy heads the uh, National Prosecuting Authority. We'll give you more after this.